So, um, so we're turning to Hebrews chapter 11. We're turning to Psalm 63. And we're going to go to Genesis chapter number 5. All right, so Genesis chapter 5, Psalm 63, and Hebrews chapter 11. I'll say it one more time. All right, Genesis chapter 5, Psalm 63, and Hebrews chapter 11. And we're looking at being a, or walking with God, the theme of walking with God and what that actually means, walking with God. Who can, who can tell me what walking with God means as if you remember anything that we've been studying or teaching? Anybody at all? You remember anything? <laughs> I know y'all do. People get shy. I get it. I get it. Being aware, practicing the presence of God, realizing that God, man, is with you every second of the day. He's watching everything that you watch. He hears everything that you hear, knows everything that, that you're, you're doing. So you got to practice the presence of God. You know, if, if, I, if somebody were to say, hey, man, someone's going to follow you around a week with a camera, everything that you do, would, would it change how you live? I hope not. Because God's camera is a whole lot greater than any camera on this planet. Amen? Boy. Yes, man. He's the ultimate camera. Yes, indeed. But walking with God also requires obedience. Remember that? And we learned that in Deuteronomy 5, 33. You shall walk in the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. And so obedience, of course, is required. Amos 3, 3 says, can two walk down the road together unless they're in agreement, Right? So walking with God means that you're in agreement with God. God's in agreement with you. And you're in, agree you're in agreement with how you're spending your time. You're in agreement with God and how you're spending his money. You're in agreement with God and how you're conducting yourself and your behavior. You're in agreement with God. That's what it means walking with God. It means you're in agreement with God. But you're being obedient to the Lord. But it also involves what? Walking with God involves what? What else? We learned. What's that? Witnessing. Witnessing. Well, we're going to get that today. Yes, indeed. Knowing him. Well, yeah, you, you got to know him first and foremost before you can be obedient to him. Amen? Absolutely. Intimate. Yes, right. Really knowing him. Not knowing of him, but really knowing him. And, and you, you know in your heart of hearts that he claims to know you. That's the most important thing. Is it not? You know, I can raise my hand and say, I know him. But does that mean that I know him? But if he says he knows me, it's that's altogether different amen boy yes indeed all right so it, it means depending on him trusting in him man walking with god means dependence you know uh, micah 6 8 he has showed thee O man what is good and what does the lord require of thee but to do justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with your god to walk humbly and to be aware that you are truly and utterly and totally dependent on him for everything and every good and perfect gift comes from above. Does it not say that? Amen. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. I love what Jesus told Pilate when Pilate said, Don't you know that I have the power to crucify you? What did Jesus say to him? You have no authority. You have no power at all unless it's been granted to you from what? Above. Boy, you think about that. Man, that's, that's power, man. Amen. What does the Bible say? Many are the plans of a man's heart or a lady's heart, but nevertheless, what? The counsel of the Lord will stand. Boy, that's why we pray to get into his will. We don't pray to change his mind because his mind's already made up. Amen? Made up from eternity. Your life has already been mapped out and planned out. So that's why we pray to seek his will, not to change his mind. Are you with me? All right, walking with God also means following the example of Jesus. Remember that? I see a lot of fans. Are, are people hot? Well, yeah, that's probably a loaded question. I might, I might start a church fight. <laughs> the cold group, the hot group, right? <laughs> Boy. All right, 1 John 2, 6, He that saith he abideth in Christ, Jesus ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Boy. And how do we walk in Jesus? Well, the Bible says just as you receive the Lord, how did you receive him? By what? By faith. You're also to walk by faith faith in the lord amen absolutely and faith in what faith in yourself 
put our faith in God's word, his trust in his word, amen, the Bible, his holy word. Yes, so it means that we're imitating the life of Christ. And how do we walk like Christ? We, we have to allow Christ to walk inside of us in the power of the Holy Spirit. He lives his life in and through us. That's how you demonstrate your Christianity. Not by holding your breath and counting to ten and saying, I'm going to get angry anymore. No, it's, Lord, man, I can't defeat sin. I can't beat sin. I'm laying myself out on the operating table. And, Lord, you're the one that needs to operate on me. Amen? You're the only one that can do it. Boy. So it means, men, uh, walking as Christ walked. Which brings us to what? Walking with God necessitates living in the Spirit. You can't live the Christian life without what? The Holy Spirit. Amen? And then walking with God results in what? What's the ultimate goal of walking with God? What's his ultimate goal for you to walk with him? Why does God want you to walk with him? So you can be like him and be with him forever. That's not that what it says in Corinthians? To conform us into the image of Christ? So that's the goal of walking with God, is so that he can conform us into the image of Christ and that we can let our light, his light, shine in us before men that they may glorify God who's in heaven. Amen? Why? So that other people can know that he's real, that he exists, that he's in the soul-saving business, life-changing business today. Amen? Boy, a testimony that's been changed by God. What a testimony. And Enoch was a man who had a great testimony. So let's go in your Bibles now to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. So we looked at a lot about what walking with God means, and we're going to come back later on, and we're going to look at the importance of our conduct and what God's word says about our conduct, our attitude, how we uh, behave ourselves in public and in private, the decisions that we make, you know, how much does God weigh on those things? Is he concerned about your conduct? Is he concerned about your behavior? Is he concerned about your testimony? Is he concerned about... Uh, other people's eternity? Well, what's he going to use to see people get saved? You, your testimony, your behavior, all of those things, amen? The Holy Spirit, the Word of God? Absolutely. So your life counts. It really does. Why? Because your life could be used by God to change the eternity of somebody else. That says something. That means something. That means that your life, my life, is more precious than gold. Boy. So let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Look at what it says there in verse 5. It says, by faith, Enoch. Now, you remember what his name means? Who can tell me what his name means? We looked at that as well. His name means two things. No, dedicated, and it means one who is yielded. Dedicated and one who is yielded. Are you dedicated and yielded to the Lord? Amen. Boy, what a great name. And he was, and he lived up to his name, and God helped him do it. He sure did. So it says, by faith, Enoch was translated. He was raptured. He was taken off the planet that he should not see death and was not found. I love that. And was not found. Boy, that's key. What does that mean when it says he wasn't found? Huh? They couldn't find him? So, you, so you, you can't find something unless you're what? Looking for it, right? You can't be found. Chances are you're never going to find it unless you what? Look for it. But it says he wasn't found, so that means they were looking for him. So he had influence in people's lives because he was missed. Boy, do you see that? Boy. Which means, uh, and we're getting to it, it's not just walking with God, but also walking with God means that you're a 24-7, 365 witness for God. You're an ambassador for God. You represent the Lord every second of the day that you breathe air. You live to represent who he is. Amen? And anything that falls short of representing the Lord is what? Sin. Because for all have sinned and fallen short of the... Uh, and what does that mean? What does it mean to fall short of the glory of God? What's that? You miss the mark. In other words, you're not behaving correctly. You're not acting like God would act. You're not saying what God would say. You're not reacting the way God would react. You don't have the same demeanor that he has. So anyway, anything short of, of Jesus Christ and what he would do, what he would say, who he is, God says is sin in our life. So that's why we need to be filled with him so that we don't sin and that we can have a life that people can look at and say, hey, there's, there is a difference in that person. 
And that difference is not him. It's not religion. It's not the people that he hangs out with. Man, there's something really different about that boy or that girl, and it's God in their life. Amen? Boy, that's what we want. Absolutely. So, it says they translate for, for I love the last part. And this is what we want on our tombstone. If you have anything that you want on your tombstone, I pray that it's this right here. It says, God translated him for, before his translation, he had this testimony that he what? That he pleased God. Again, I'm going to ask the question. Name one thing better that you can put on your tombstone. Return to sender. <laughs> Return to sender. Amen. <laughs> Yes, to be absent from the body is to be what? Yes, absolutely. Boy, oh boy, I like that. Return to sender. That's the first for me. I love it. Amen? I do. Here, let me, uh, all right, here. Let's go to uh, Psalm 63 now. Psalm 63. And then we'll go over there to Genesis after this. All right? Now, this is David when he was in the wilderness, Okay. Uh, probably running from Absalom when all that was going on. Absalom was trying to usurp his authority. And uh, he was out there in the wilderness hearing this psalm. And I tell you what, you know, he's, uh, he's, in, he's in pretty dire straits. But at the same time, when you look at this psalm, man, it's like a psalm where he is having a feast in the middle of the desert. There's no food, there's no water, but yet he's having a feast better than Thanksgiving. He's having a feast... Better than a Thanksgiving that was made for a king. Boy, he's having a feast out in the wilderness. So much better than Thanksgiving could offer. Let's look at what it says. I love this psalm, man. It says, O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. That word there in the Hebrew means anticipation. Have you ever as a kid, like maybe your parents said, hey, we're going to the amusement park tomorrow? And boy, you just couldn't wait to get up that next day. It just seemed like every minute turned into an hour and every hour turned into a year. <laughs> That same word there is, and you're anticipating to meet with God because you know him and you're walking with him and because you're enamored with him and you're in love with him. Man, he's anticipating uh, God to rescue him. And he's saying, listen, clearly right up front in this song, God, you are the only one, the only one that can help me. No flesh can help me but you. Now, God uses people to help other people, but you've got to realize it's all coming from God. If anybody's helping you, God gave that person the help to help you. God gave that person the means to be able to help you. God gave that person the gift and everything else that they have to be able to help you. So everything comes from God, amen? I remember this guy, he had um, a Lou Gehrig's syndrome in the hospital, I think it is, where it, it, it cripples you to where you can't even move. And I remember, man, for the first time, and this guy was worked with his hands. He was, he was a, a carpenter, man, did so much with his hands. And he said... I now, day for the first time, understand what it means when you're absolutely nothing and helpless without God. Boy, he goes, well, God's really put a fine point on that for me. You know, I forgot that God's the one that gave me my health. God's the one that gave me my strength. God's the one that has given me all this stuff behind the scenes that I've completely forgotten. And God's reminded me that, man, I can do nothing. I can be nothing. I can't even talk or breathe unless God allows it. Amen? Boy. That's why I tell you what, man, this angel study has got me fired up, man. I just, you know, you, you've read that verse a million times, but, man, the angel said, glory to God in the highest. Every atom of their existence, they exist to want to brag on, glorify God Almighty. Man, that's what they want to talk about is God. They want to point people to God. That's what we should do. Amen? Is point people to how awesome he is. Wow. Let's keep reading. O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Now, he's running from his enemies. Think about that. What, what, what better place to run from your enemy? Who wants to live out in the desert where there's no food and water? So in one sense of the word, yeah, there's peace and there's shelter out there. God's protecting him. But on the other hand, there's famine, starvation, difficulty, problems. He's being pursued. Boy. But notice what he says, man. The first thing he says, oh, God. Did you see that? First thing he said wasn't, man, I, I, well, I need to call, what's his face? Or so-and-so. I need to get a hold of my general. Man, I'm, I'm in trouble. <laughs> what did he say? Oh, God. Amen? That's the first person that we turn to. Then he says this, to see thy power and thy glory. Man, don't you want to see the power and the glory of God? 
Well, I know I do. Man, even Moses had that desire to want to see God face to face. Remember that? Lord, let me see you. Man, he wanted to have that burning desire to see him. And what did God say? Man, no man can see my face and live. But I'll let you see uh, what, what he says was, I'm going to put you in the cup of the rock, and I'm going to let you see my receding glory as I go back into heaven. And God's receding glory was so powerful, what did it do? It made his face what? Glow, where he had to put a veil over his face. Wow, man, that's just the receding glory of God. To make a human skin shine? God is awesome, man. Amen? Boy, wow. Listen to this. Verse 3 is one of my favorite verses, man. Boy. It is, man. Look at verse 3. Because thy loving kindness is better than what? Man, my lips shall praise thee. Man, because your loving kindness is better than what? Life itself. Did you hear that? Guys, listen. Life is a precious, awesome thing, is it not? But would you want to live your life without the Lord? Man, that's why Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon when he was older, when he repented. After he got away from the Lord, he repented, and God used him to write that book. And when you look at Ecclesiastes, the first half of that book was written from the perspective of living life without God under the sun. And what did he say? It's futile. It's vanity. Man, it's, it's empty. It's chasing bubbles. It's, man, in other words, it's misery and horrible. No wonder why suicide is such, such a, a dilemma these days. Man, they've been taught, they've been animals their whole life through evolution and everything else. Man, they exist apart from God. Man, no wonder why there's so much misery and heartache in this world and there's no peace. How? parts of the earth they shall fall by the sword they shall be the portion for foxes but the king shall rejoice in God everyone that swears by him shall glory but the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped so David is longing for God David is saying listen God is the only one that can truly help me and he is feasting on the Lord in the middle of the wilderness in the midst of his problems what is he feasting on? He's remembering the tenderness. Man, the loving kindness of the Lord is better than life itself. Man, think about that. Man, God is life. He is our life. Amen? Boy. Let me ask you a question. If you take a fish out of water, what happens? If you take a tree out of soil, what happens? If you separate man from God, what happens? He dies. Boy, now. With all that said, you know, water is water without fish, right? Water is still water without fish, but a fish without water is what? Dead and nothing, right? Soil is soil without a tree, but a tree without soil is what? Dead. Now, God is God without man, amen? He was here before us, he'll be here after us, amen? But man without God is what? Dead dead boy man he is our life that's why the bible says that we're complete in him 
Man, it's, it's waking up and saying, God, honestly, man, I can do nothing. I can be nothing. I can't have victory. I can't get victory over my sin. I can't get victory over anything today unless you do it in me and through me. And acknowledging that, amen? Man, telling God that you need him. That's why he says, pour your heart out to him. Man, I tell God every day, Lord, I'm nothing without you. I'm nothing without you. Lord, I'm not. And Lord, I really want to mean that when I say it with all my heart because I'm nothing without you. But Lord, you are everything and you truly make life worth more than living because of your loving kindness and who you are. Amen? Wow. Boy. You see, guys, it's... It's, 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 that, it's that thing, oh, you Baptist preachers are all hellfire and brimstone. Well, I wish they were. There's a lot of them that are not, amen? But we witness to warn people from hell, but we also witness to people because we want to introduce them to the one that's unexplainable. Man, the one who has helped you with everything that you've been helped with, amen? Man, I want to brag on him. I want to introduce you to him. I want you to know him. I want, you, I want to talk about him, man. I, I want you to know, man, he is everything, He's everything, and so he, he's so awesome that you, you, your mouth gets all bungled up to the point where you can't even say words anymore how awesome he is. Amen? Why would you not want to introduce people to him? See, people look at witnessing from, well, i got to warn them because I don't want them to go to hell. And that's true. We need to do that. But, but your motivation should be all the more so because, man, you love him so much. Why would you want to brag on him and introduce him to everybody that you meet? Amen? Who else could you introduce that's greater, more powerful, more loving, more kind, more merciful, more tender, more helpful than him? Amen? Boy. Enoch walked with God, and he had a testimony that pleased God. Well, I love that. Go, go in your Bible now to Genesis chapter 5. All right, verse 19. And Jared lived after he begot Enoch 800 years, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. And Enoch lived 65 years, so he was young, and he begot Methuselah. So he got married. He had a son. Prior to those 65 years, man, Enoch was a heathen just like everybody else. Didn't know God, wasn't walking with God. The Bible doesn't say how he come to know the Lord. Maybe his wife had difficulty in pregnancy with Methuselah. We don't know. But we do know that his son was born, and he also himself was born again, if you will. That's when he began to walk with God and had a relationship with God. I wish the Bible would say how he come to know him, but, he, but it doesn't. But then it says this, And he not walked with God after he bought Methuselah 300 years, and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Boy, and Methuselah lived. 187 and he went on to be the longest living man in the world and what does Methuselah's name mean anybody this is important what does Methuselah's name mean when you look at Methuselah you're looking at God's time clock of grace and mercy ending he was God's time clock saying hey when this guy dies the flood's going to come that's what his name means it will come it will come. And when he died, guess what came? The flood. Boy. So he was the longest living man in the world. And God was using that man as a time clock to say, when this man dies, my mercy and grace is done. The flood is coming. Boy. Boy, oh boy. Methuselah, Enoch's son. All right, so, so we learn what walking with God means. But walking with God, as our dear sister pointed out, also means that you're a witness for God. You're an ambassador for God. You represent the Lord all the time. Hebrews 11.5 again, for before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, go in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. I still hear pages turning. All right. It's all right. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. What does God say about walking with God, not only being obedient and relying and trusting on him, being conformed into his image, relying on the Holy Spirit, all of those things, but also is being a witness for God. You are a witness 24-7, 365. Do you know that? You realize that? That you're a beacon. 
Boy, you are, whether you like that or not. Look, look at what it says, that the genuineness of your faith being much more what? Precious than what? Gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what does God say about the value of your testimony is to this world? What value does God place on your testimony? More precious than gold. Man, and beyond that, amen? More precious than gold. Man, how are you treating your testimony? Why? Because it's your testimony that people are looking at to determine whether or not they want to listen to you. Tell them about Jesus or not tell them about Jesus. You know, if you see me walking out of a liquor store and I say, hey, Jesus loves you, man, I'm a Baptist preacher. I mean, do you think that person's going to want to listen to me too much? Why not? Because, man, your testimony counts for the Lord. Amen? It does. And don't think that he doesn't take it seriously. Let me ask you a question. If you, if you spent your life savings and you put all your effort into uh, this project and you made a, a certain type of clothing or whatever it may be, and you hire someone to represent you and your company, and they, they show up with holes in their jeans, ties all sloppy, bad breath, didn't brush their teeth, all that stuff. Is that someone that you want representing you? Would that upset you at all? If that was an important meeting, and this was your one-time shot, this is how this person shows up to represent you. Well, think about that times eternity, because that's who we are. Man, we're representing the Lord. I remember my wife. When she was lost, she was living with a guy boy and she tried to witness to the guy that she was living with and he looked at her and said you're trying to witness to me the word of god says that you're not even supposed to be doing this don't try to witness to me and tell me that you're a christian when you're in here trying to li live in my house with me boy he got thrown back in her face she was lost i remember one time uh this guy had a radar detector in his car and I said, hey, man, I'm going to be witnessing to this dear, this guy I've been working with. Can you please take that, that thing off, off of your, and just kind of hide it and, you know, you use it when you're, you know, that's up to you. You do what you want with it, but can you, can you just please put, oh, no, no, I ain't going to put it up. So he gets in the car, and we're driving down the road. He goes, hey, man, we're talking about Christ and the Lord and all that, my friend, and, and he's in the back seat, the guy that I'm trying to witness to. And all of a sudden, he taps my friend on the shoulder. He goes, hey, can I ask you a serious question? He said, yeah. He goes, why does a Christian need a radar detector? boy and I looked at him I said I told you Just kidding. I didn't I didn't do that <laughs> but if you don't think people are watch, watching they are I remember I lived in barracks the barracks in, in uh, McDill or not McDill but in Dias Air Force Base Abilene Texas when I was lost I was eating I used to drink beer out there all the time and I remember after I got saved I came outside of my room with a glass of apple juice and there was a group of people, about six people, that looked up at me and said, Dave Unger, what is that in your hand? Is that a beer? Just like that. And I said, no. They said, I don't believe you. I said, I literally had to come down there and let them taste it. So what did I do? I started drinking Diet Coke like a dummy. <laughs> so they would know what I was in my hand. Amen? Boy. But people are looking at your testimony, are they not? And listen, your testimony is either going to be one that brings praise, honor, and glory to the Lord or shame, hypocrisy, and embarrassment to the Lord. Boy, if I were to walk up to your wife and say to your wife, hey, I want your engagement ring. Please let me have it. I'm going to take it to the pawn shop and sell it. What would you say? Why would you say no? I mean, it's just a piece of metal. It's just a dumb old diamond and a piece of metal. I mean, what's the big deal about your engagement ring? Ah, because you would say my husband not only worked hard for that for me, thinking about me the whole time he was doing it, but he also bought this ring with his heart. Amen? He put his whole heart into this. This is not just a piece of metal, but, man, it represents his heart to me. Amen? So it would be a precious thing. You would deem that to be precious. And guys... The Lord is saying, your testimony is that precious to me. But much more so than that. Amen? Boy, your testimony, your name is precious to the Lord. Man, it really is. How do you treat your testimony that God's given to you? Boy, so without a testimony, you can't what? Can't be used to convict people, can you? 
Go in your Bible. Here's a verse that you need to underline. Go in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's see there if I'm right. My, verse, if my memory is serving me right. Go to Hebrews 12 verse, is it 14? Yes, Hebrews 12, 14. You might want to underline this verse. This is a good verse, guys. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Listen to what it says now. I'll give you guys a second to get there. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. You guys there? All right. Follow peace with what? And holiness without which no what? So if you're not pursuing holiness, what does God's word say is going to happen to your testimony? No one will see the Lord. Boy. So does your conduct matter to the Lord? Boy, it does. Amen. He puts a lot of weight on it. Are we not going to stand before him one day? Give an account of everything that we've ever said and done. Why in the body? After being saved. Amen. We looked at that, did we not? Boy. So, God's love, man, is valuable. Man, so he walked with God. He was a witness for God. And then we're going we're gonna to come back, but let's go to uh, Jude chapter 14 now. Go to Jude chapter 14. Take a right turn and go to the book of Jude. If you get to Revelation, take a left. You've gone too far. All right. Jude is right next to the book of Revelation. And we're going to look at verse 14 and 15. So walking with God means that you're a witness for God 24-7, 365. Amen? Let me ask you a serious question. Let's say you had a family out there in the ocean, and there was one lighthouse that was to keep burning. And the lighthouse keeper had one job, and that was to make sure the light stayed burning. He was trained, knew how to do it. And then the storm comes, and let's say the lighthouse keeper just had an attitude and said, you know what, I'm done with this job. They've been treating me like dirt, and he purposely turns the light out on the ship that's out there with your family members on it. Seriously, what would you think of a lighthouse keeper that would do that in the middle of a storm, turning the light out? That would be evil. Well, that would be murderous, would it not? Boy, guys, you have a testimony for the Lord. God commands us to share the gospel. Amen? Remember that story I told you guys about uh, the Prime Minister of England during World War II? What was his name? Churchill. Remember that? Remember how Churchill had all those coal miners that went on strike? At the worst part of the war, they went on strike because they needed that coal to make all the bombs and bullets and all the things they needed to win the war. Remember that? And remember old Churchill? I don't know what Churchill said or did. Maybe he had a silent prayer to the Lord. I don't know, but God gave that man wisdom that day. Boy. And he went, to the, he went to all those miners and said, Hey, guys, after World War II is over, I'm going to be walking down the street, and I'm going to run into the baker. And I'm going to ask that baker, What did you do to help win World War II? And that baker is going to tell me that he baked for his family, and he also baked for the soldiers to help win World War II. And then I'm going to walk down the street, and I'm going to see a shoemaker. And I'm going to say, What did you do to contribute to help win World War II? And he's going to say, Man, I made shoes for my family to put food on the table, but I made boots for the soldiers so they could march and win the war and then I'm going to be walking down the street and I'm going to run into a bunch of coal miners and I'm going to ask those coal miners now what did you do to help win World War II and they said that you could hear a pin drop all those coal miners holding up their picket signs and then he said and that coal miner is going to look back at me and say man we went deep into those mines with our picks and shovels and we picked for our families to put food on the table but we also picked so that we can make bombs and bullets and all the things that we need to win this war and that's all he said they said as the newspaper article had, was written and they said hey, slowly but surely everyone put down their picket their picket signs and went back to work so here's the question when God you stand before God and God's going to look at you and say now what did you do to help win the war the battle of souls what did you do to contribute did you honor the fact that I the Lord put a premium and preciousness and a priceless price tag on you and your testimony are you treating it that way boy amen man oh man I tell you what let's go to Jude now so you're walking with God which means you're a witness for God amen but also Enoch not only shared or taught or preached he preached the word of God he not only lived it he also lived it amen did you notice how conduct comes before him speaking the word of God boy your conduct has to be in line in other words 
What does God say about people that hear the word but don't want to listen to it? They honor me with their lips, but their what? Heart's far from me. It's not the hear of the word that's blessed, but it's the what that's blessed? The doer of the word that's blessed. Amen? So he says this in Jude. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. So he's walking with God. But you know he's drawing close to God. So now he's gonna, he loves God so much he wants to warn people against God's wrath. And if you really love God, you're going to love people and you're going to want to warn them. Amen. So he warns them and says, now Enoch, the seven from Adam prophesied, preached about these men, false teachers, also saying, behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in ungodly ways and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Enoch was a Christian who lived the gospel. But he also lipped the gospel. But you got to live it first, amen? Boy, are you lipping the gospel? Are you sharing the gospel of Christ? Are you witnessing to those that don't know the Lord? Your family, your friends, your co-workers, people that you know. Are you intentionally saying, Lord, give me an opportunity to witness to my family? Give me the boldness. Give me the wisdom to see that opportunity. Give me the boldness when I'm in that opportunity. Lord, help me to witness to my family, my friends, or whoever they are. Are you planning that? Are you purposely, intentionally asking the Lord to help you do that? Why? I like what my brother said. He goes, you know, know, people get worried about offending people. And we worry about that, do we not? We do. I certainly wouldn't want my personality to do it. Now, if God's word does it, that's something altogether different. But if I'm doing it, then I need to repent and apologize. Amen? But not God's word. Boy. But my brother would say, Dave, listen, don't worry about offending people when you're telling them the truth. I was young. He says, because think about it. Are you going to offend them to hell number two or hell number one? They're going to hell. They need to be told. They need to be warned. They need So if they get upset and mad, listen, on Judgment Day, I'd rather have them be upset and mad with me here and think that I'm cruel and mean by telling them the truth than rather than being that guy that just slaps them on the back and tells them that they're okay and everything's all right. And we laugh and get along great on planet Earth. But when we stand before the Lord on Judgment Day, could you imagine that person looking at you saying, why on God's green earth didn't you warn me and about eternal hell where I'm going to burn forever, be separated from God for all eternity? Why on God's green earth would you not tell me? Amen? Boy, that's why we got to walk close with the God. You can't be bold like that unless he helps you be bold like that. Amen? We need his boldness. Listen, I get scared to death talking to people one-on-one. I'd rather preach to 10,000 people than talk to a person one-on-one sometimes about Christ. Why? Because there's a battle. Man, Satan doesn't make it easy. Amen? You get nervous, you get scared, all of those things. Now, listen, I'm not here to beat you up. I'm not. Well, God knows your heart. But are you trying to share the gospel? And are you doing that? Boy, listen, one thing that's going to fire you up is serving others and sharing the gospel. Man, nothing will fan the flames of your heart when God gives you opportunities to witness and share and brag about who he is. Amen? Man, listen, outreach is literally a good time. I know people are scared to death of outreach, but, man, we won't leave you hanging by yourself. Amen? And most, most of the time, 99% of the time, man, they appreciate the visit. They appreciate you coming out. They appreciate the encouragement. They really do. I've had one person tell me no the whole time I've been a Christian since December 30, 1990. One person say, quit witnessing to me. Quit praying for me and quit witnessing to me. And it was a guy who was a, a warlock. Why do you keep quoting the Bible to me? Because I don't believe the Bible, Brother Dave. Well, he didn't say Brother Dave, but he said Dave. <laughs> well, what does the Bible say? Now, I heard, I've, heard, I've heard three three teachers say, well, yeah, when it gets to that point, just quit. And I was like, excuse me? Quit. Quit. What is God's word? If somebody looks at you and says, hey, I don't want to hear scripture anymore, what do you tell them? Well, that's all I know. I want to give you scripture. Why? Because scripture is what they hear, and faith coming by hearing and hearing Dave Unger's opinion? Faith coming by hearing and hearing the what? The word of God. They have to hear the word it's the only bullet that's going to pierce that rhino's heart so if they tell you i don't want to hear it preach it more amen be in season out of season that doesn't mean having sugar sick sermon in your back pocket it means preach the word of god when people despise it and can't stand it and don't like you and want you to shut up and sit down or preach it when they're saying amen 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 
Boy. Acts 1 8, you shall be my witnesses. Did he say that you could be? No, he says that you are his witness if you're born again. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Man, teaching them everything that I've told you. Amen? Boy. What would you think of a pastor that never shared the gospel? What would you think of a pastor that didn't privately witness to people in private? Well, 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 well Brother Dave, we've got to find a pastor that's going to do that because I can't witness to my family. We need a pastor to do that. That's wrong too, amen? Well, God's called you to do it and me to do it. Are you with me? All right. Well, not only did he walk with God and witness for God and preach the word of God, but Enoch all of a sudden was in the wonderful presence of God. And one day we're going to be in his wonderful presence too. Uh, Genesis 5.24, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. By faith, Enoch was taken away that he did not see death and he was not found. Boy, so he was a man that was used of God to warn this generation that the rapture's coming. So let me ask you a question. Are you really truly walking with God? Are you honoring your testimony that he's given you? Now, very quickly, go like this. Warm your fingers up real quick like that, all right? All right, go in your Bible now to Proverbs. Go to Proverbs. All right, I want you to go to Proverbs 14. Proverbs chapter 14. Now get your fingers warmed up now. All right, get them warmed up. We're going to move we're going to move along. So, did you notice what came first though before witnessing and being translated and all that God focused on his walk, his conduct. Your life is pleasing to me. Did you notice that he didn't say everything that you did for me I'm pleased with? It says he had a testimony that he pleased God. God is more interested in what he's doing in you than he can do through you. Does God need you to do anything for him? No, but but he does want you to be like his son Jesus. That's top priority. Amen? Boy, it is. It is. So Proverbs 14, verse 2, let's look at what God says about our conduct. He that walketh in his uprightness feared the Lord. But he that is perverse in his ways despises him. Do you want to be a person that's guilty of despising the Lord? God says, well, when you name my name and you live contrary to how you know that my name is, then you're beginning to despise me. Boy, think about that. Think about how upset you are when people gossip about you. Think about how hurt you've been by people saying things that weren't true of you. Does that not hurt your heart? And this, this, man, think about how hurt you are. And listen, we're sinful people who want justice. Think about a holy, righteous God and how much he wants justice when people misrepresent him. Why? Because eternity is at stake for people. Man, what a, what a slap in my wife's face and a good one at that, amen? Don't try to witness to me. Here you are being with me. You're going to try to tell me about Jesus? Boy. Now, she was lost. Keep that in mind. Amen? She didn't know. All right, go to Proverbs chapter 20 now. Proverbs chapter 20. Look at verse 11. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 11. Let's look at what it says. Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. Can you not, as an adult, look at a kid and know if they're behaving or misbehaving? Amen. Is that not a big deal to a parent? Especially when you're at a birthday party and all your friends are there looking at you, looking at your kid. And when your kid acts up, who do they represent? And who, who are people more hard on, the kid or the parent? The parent, right? Think about the Lord. Hey, man, you represent me. Don't drag my name in the muck and mire of this world. Don't use my name as a filthy curse word. Don't use my name in filthy jokes. Don't use my name in all this stuff. Amen? Boy. We all need help, do we not? Man, we do. All right, look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 26 now. Say in the same chapter, 20, verse 26. A wise king scattereth the wicked and bringeth the will of justice over them. So in other words, a king who is wise pays attention to his subject's conduct and how they're conducting themselves. Amen? Boy. 
So God puts a lot of emphasis on that. And of course, we can't conduct ourselves in the way the Lord wants unless we're relying on him. We're filled with the spirit. We're depending on him. We're acknowledging, Lord, I can't do it, but you and me can. Amen. I'm willing. All right, Proverbs 22. Go to Proverbs 22, verse 1. Proverbs 22, verse 1. Let's look at what God's word says to us. But man, God's word is like a shower to the heart, is it not? Boy, it is. Look at what it says in Proverbs 22, verse 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than what? Now, did you hear what he said? How many people have sold their soul for great riches? Boy, man, people have sold their soul for a piece of bread. And God says your name, your testimony is more precious than great riches. Boy. It'd be better for you to have a quiet time with God in the morning than for you to wake up without him and go find a great treasure. Why? Because what did he tell Abraham? I, the Lord, am your exceeding, exceeding great reward. Amen? Over the top, incomprehensible. I'm the greatest reward of all. Man, knowing him, walking with him, man, having that abundant life. Amen? Wow. Seriously, let me ask you a question. If somebody were to put a billion dollars in front of you right now and say, I want you to deny Jesus Christ that you know him, would it, would it, would it, would it even be a, a thought in your head? Now, I know our flesh is weak, but I'm talking about our spirit now. God says don't put any confidence in the flesh, amen? So I'm talking about our spirit. And you would say no instantly. It would be an insult to you, would it not? It would be an, an utter insult. You can't put a price on knowing God, amen? Boy, if I were to say to you, hey, listen, you don't need that pinky finger. Let me give you $50,000 for it. What would you say? Now, there might be somebody that says yes. I wouldn't say no to them, amen? But, but man, in other words, guys, listen, you're valuable to the Lord. You're priceless. You're precious. Amen? All right, go, go, go to Proverbs chapter 25, verse 26. Proverbs 25, verse 26. Keep, keep warming them fingers up now. Proverbs 25, 26. Keep warming them up real quick. All right, let's look at what Proverbs 25, 26 says. A righteous man falling down before the wicked as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. Do you see that? Boy, have you ever drank from a clean spring or a clean source of water? But then somebody muddies it and messes it all up? God says that when you give way before the wicked man you're mudding up the testimony the lens is no longer going to be able to shine his light let your light shine the bible says you know you're the light god says you know he's in you he's the light but man does the bible say take a light and put it under a bed or under a bushel are you hiding the gospel you're that light you're not to be hiding under a bed or under a bushel man when you leave this did you ever notice those two signs above our door you are now entering the mission field Man, people are looking at your life. Eternity is at stake. Your testimony, God can use to change someone's life. Are you with me? Man, God used my brother to change my whole family's life. We saw the power of God. We saw him get out of drugs and all those things. And it wasn't friends. It wasn't family. It wasn't hanging out with the right people. Man, it was Jesus that changed that boy's life. Amen? Boy. This is where... You got to say, Lord, please protect me. Please help me. Please don't let me fail. Please don't let me disappoint you, man. I pray that all the time. Lord, help me finish well. I pray that you guys finish well too, amen? Listen, I'm not preaching perfection. I'm not. We're preaching progression, amen? He's, he, he's merciful. That's why he, he gave us 1 John 1, 9. If we fail, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, amen? Amen. All right, Proverbs 28, really quick. Proverbs 28. Verse 9. Boy, this is a good one right here, boy. Woo. Listen to this one. Proverbs 28, verse 9. Uh-oh. How important is it to come to church and hear God's word? And be eager to hear it? And not just want to hear it, but receive it. Say, Lord, I, hey, listen, I'm not here for the preacher. I'm not here for another sermon. I'm not here for nothing else. I'm here for you to speak to me and change my life. Transform my heart. I don't want to be filled with head knowledge. I don't want a cute little story. Lord, I want you to change my life with your word. That should be every pastor's desire when he teaches. Man, to, man pray that God will use it to change people. Amen? 
Look at Proverbs 28, verse 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing God's law, even his prayer shall be what? Man, did you hear that? Boy, man, your prayer is an abomination if you turn away from the law. Wow, boy. That's pretty serious. All right, go to Proverbs 28, verse 18. Proverbs 28, verse 18. Whoso walketh uprightly shall be what? But he that is perverse in his way shall what? Fall at once. All right, go in your Bible to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, verse 25. Verse 25. Look at what it says now. Proverbs 29, verse 25. The fear of man bringeth a what? A snare, but who putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. That's why we shouldn't be afraid of man. Especially for a pastor. Well, we've got to pray that all the time. Lord, help me get in that pulpit and not be afraid of any faith that's out there. No matter what anybody's told me that week, oh, it, well, you know, Dave, I'm guilty of this. Well, you know, I'm preaching on that very thing on Sunday, so don't think I'm beating you up. Amen? You've got to preach the full counsel of God. Do we not? So us preacher boys, man, we need God's help. We need God's boldness. We need all this, especially during a funeral. That's when the devil really comes to a pastor and says, hey, you better tone it down. All these people out here hurting, and you're going to get up there, man, sweating and spitting and all that, man. You think they want to hear all that? Boy, he, he, he can intimidate you. Boy, you go through all kinds of stuff. Even when, like, a guest speaker comes, the devil shows up and says, hey, this pastor might be better than you. And what if, what if they like him better than they like you? <laughs> he whispers that stuff in your ear. You know what you got to do? You got to get on your knees and say, God, I pray that that boy comes and preaches 10 times better than I do. And I pray that 10 times more people get saved than, than when I preach. That's what you need to do. Because we're serving the same general fighting the same devil. Amen? If I'm in a foxhole and a bear's coming at me and my gun jams, I got a buddy who's got a Winchester and I've got a Remington, do, do I care what, what brand that we have at that moment? Am I all caught up in that? Am I caught up in who gets the credit, who shoots the bear that's about to maul both of us? I don't care, brother. Pull the trigger. Shoot. Amen. I, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll stuff them for you and put them on your wall and say you shot them. Amen. Boy. All right, look what it says in Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel now, very quickly. Ezekiel. Ezekiel. That's in your Old Testament now. Ezekiel 36.23. Ezekiel 36.23. Now here he's about to put Israel uh, a prophecy say that he's going to bring Israel back from, from dead bones and all of those things and restore Israel, make them a nation again. But in the middle of that, in verse 23, he says, And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified before their eyes. So God wants to be sanctified. Amen? He wants to be sanctified as holy. Boy, he does. All right, Daniel 1.8. Let me just read this to you really quick. Daniel chapter 1.8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Boy, listen to this. Go in your Bible to Leviticus chapter 10, verse 13, or verse 3. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3. That's in your old, that's all the way back. Go all the way back to the first five books of the, of the Bible. All right. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3. Boy, this is a great verse right here, man. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3. All right, in Leviticus... Chapter 10, verse 3, it says this. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me are those, among those who draw near to me, I will be sanctified. In other words, I will be honored before all the people. I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. God says that when you approach him, I will be treated holy. I will be sanctified as holy amen in other words i god am your daddy and you can come to me that way because we can cry abba father but at the same time you don't walk up to him and just slap him on the back like a back slapping buddy and just say whatever you want to either amen he's the king of kings and the lord of lords amen boy and yet he gives us leeway to come to him and express our heart does he not 
Let me just say this, Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 1 Peter 1, 7, verse 9, we just read that, that your, your testimony is more precious than gold. Listen to what 1 Peter 2, 12 says. I'm going to shut this down after a couple more. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, in other words, your behavior, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they behold glorify God in the day of visitation. So in other words, they may want to use your life as an excuse, but if you're living the way you're supposed to, they can't. Amen? Boy. And God put that in his word. Listen to what Colossians 4, verse 5 and 6 says. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. And here's that verse. Let your speech be always, always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Did you hear what he said? Always with grace. So that means when you leave this, this, this room, that means that you have eternity on your mind. That means that when I went to the car dealership and I was all upset that day, when they were jacking me around after 10 days of waiting, and I was walking to my car, and I turned around, remember that, to give them a piece of my mind, <laughs> to let them know that, hey, man, this is ridiculous, 10 days, rah, 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 rah. Boy, at that moment, God's like, now, are you, are you focused on the temporary or the eternal? Because if you're focused on the eternal, you're going to understand that this motor in eternity is not going to mean a hill of beans to anybody. But the way you go in there and talk to that man means everything in eternity. The way you talk to that man who you're irritated at, who's done everything he can to help you. It's not his fault. Amen? Boy. But it's easy to forget that. Easy to forget that when you walk outside your house and forget how precious and how awesome your testimony really is to the Lord and how people really depend on it that really don't think they're depending on it, but they are. They need to hear God's word. Amen? Amen. Yes, sir. I'm going to ask Brother George to close us in prayer and then take a break, and then we'll meet here at 1130, and we'll start our business meeting. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for coming.